everybody. How are we doing tonight? Good. Hey, all right. That wasn't that bad. That wasn't that bad. Can we give it up one more time for our worship team? Didn't they do a great job? Amen. Cool. Well, if this is your first time here, or maybe you haven't been here in a minute, we want to welcome you. Thank you guys for joining us. Maybe someone dragged you here. Maybe that someone was your parent, but we're glad that you're here. Anyway, my name is Lewis. For those of you that don't know, I have the honor, the privilege of being the creative director here at the church, and I am one of your student leaders, and I am excited to be able to bring this word to you today. Uh, we're in a series called Feels, as you can see behind me and on the side by that nice graphic there, uh, and we've been in this for a couple weeks. The first week, Nikki brought an awesome message on worrying, worry. So give it up for Nikki. It was a great message. And then last week, Jen, for the first time, brought a message on sadness. Let's give it up for Jen one time real quick. Sweet. So today, I'm going to be bringing a message about anger, about anger. And before we get there, I just want to go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the ability to bring us in one place where we get to worship you. We get to talk about you. We don't have to worry about anybody coming in and disrupting and telling us that we can't do it, God, that we're free to worship you how we please, God. And I pray that as uh, we go through this conversation, through this message today, God, that it would be you speaking, God, and that uh, you would be in every word that is spoken and that uh, we would all have sticky hearts and sticky minds to receive what it is that you have for us. And it's in the name of the Lord that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So like I said, Today, we're going to be talking about anger, and just by a quick show of hands, how many of y'all get angry? Oh, that's a lot of us. Let me tell you something. Not many people see it. People, people see me and people that know me a little bit, they know me as a pretty like cheerful dude uh, that I'm pretty happy all the time, but let me tell you something. I have a temper. And I'm not saying that in a way that I'm proud of it. I'm not saying that in a way that I think it's a great thing, but it's just reality. It's just fact of life. I have somewhat of a temper and it normally comes out. And I would say 99% of the time this temper comes out is when I'm playing games online. How many of you know about rage quitting? How many of you? Okay. Some compilation videos on it, right? Trust me, I've seen like all of those. And I, I believe, if I would have had a camera, I probably would have been on some of those just because of how badly I rage when I play. Actually, there's a, a story from a, a few years ago that I was playing Warzone with Pastor Alex. And I don't know if you remember him. He used to help us out doing production a few years ago. His name was Marcus. And the three of us are playing Warzone online. And if you know Warzone, at least lately, you know that people cheat, people hack. Uh, People are just super sweaty, and they play really good for no reason at all. And so it happened to be one of those days that I'm playing, we're losing, we haven't gotten any wins, and I'm starting to get very, very frustrated. There was a point where I thought that I should have won, and at the last minute, someone came and shot me from behind. Now, in a moment of anger, I... I kind of just lost all, all inhibition, and I, I screamed a word that I definitely cannot repeat on this stage, and I smacked my hand on my bed really, really hard. The issue is, and I realized this maybe two minutes later, it wasn't my bed that I smacked, it was my iPad. And I cracked the screen of my iPad with just a smack like this. So if any of y'all want to come at me in a slap boxing match, don't do it because his hand cracks iPads, bro. All right? Minus touch. touch, I'm telling you, bro. So if you're like me, you're probably prone to getting into situations where you're tempted to give in to your anger. If we're not careful, those situations can snowball and can lead us into very explosive situations with our anger. While studying for this, I read somewhere that anger is only one small letter away from the word danger. If you remove the D from danger, you get anger. Now, anger isn't always bad, right? Uh, we, we have this, this connotation a lot of times when we talk about anger, like, oh, angry, I'm not allowed to be angry. And that's not necessarily true, right? There are things that we should be angry about. We should be angry about the injustices that happen in our world from day to day, the things like racism, like sexism, like any one of those things. Those are things that we should be angry about. But there are other times when we need to have control over anger, when we need to deny ourselves of that anger. 
There's a quote by this dude named Burke Parsons that says, if everything angers us, we need to repent. But if nothing angers us, we also need to repent. And the Bible puts it this way when it comes to anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, in your anger, do not sin. Other versions of the Bible will say, be angry and sin not. Meaning that it's okay to to be angry. But it also tells you that there is a, a point where your anger becomes sinful. So how do you know what that point is? Like if you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, like I get angry a lot. But at what point does my anger become an issue? At what point does my anger become something that's sinful, that's bad? Well, Jesus, thankfully, offers us some really, really good words of wisdom. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 26, we're going to read this passage. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead, open up. If you have your little digital Bible like you're supposed to be doing for Walter's challenge, which if you're not doing your challenge, that's on y'all. I hear that prize is pretty good. Um, So, so far, it sounds like Ebony is probably going to win that prize. So, I don't know. Go, Ebony. Um, But go ahead and turn to Matthew 5, 21, 26. And we're going to read this, and then we'll break it down little by little. So, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 says this. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Right? Talking about the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shall not murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. We're going to come back to that weird sounding word here in a couple minutes, because trust me, it is a weird sounding word. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come back and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. That's a lot to cover, and we're going to break it down. Now, this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is giving us, in part, some things that... One of the main things that he's touching on is our ability sometimes... And our, 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 our leaning towards having this outward righteousness and this like fake righteousness and our, our holier than thou righteousness that we try to put on in front of other people, but we're not taking care of the stuff that's inside. So I may seem like, oh, cool, I have my stuff together, right? I don't suffer like from lust or from anger or any of those things, but inside they're very big things that I'm struggling with. And he's telling us to, to, that it doesn't necessarily matter what's on the outside if you haven't figured out what's on the inside first, right? So he describes in, in, this, in this passage uh, anger in three simple statements, and we're going to go over it right now. The first one is that anger condemns us. Now, Obviously, God does not condemn all anger. Like we went over before, there are things that we should get angry about. There is a righteous anger that we are supposed to have. And the Bible even tells us himself, itself that, Bible, that, that God got angry. God gets angry. In, in Psalm 711, it says that God is a just God and God is angry with the wicked every day. And Jesus himself even got angry at people. There is a passage in the New Testament that talks about there were these guys in the temple selling stuff, and you weren't really supposed to be doing that. The temple was obviously just a place where you worshiped and you went to God and all those things. You weren't supposed to be selling stuff there, right? So these people are are, have their tables selling stuff, and Jesus sees this, comes in, gets super mad, starts flipping tables, cracking a whip, and running after everyone, like angry. Right? So it's good to be angry at the right things. There's, again, a righteous anger that we're supposed to have. But the kind of anger that Christ is trying to talk to us about and the one that Christ condemns here is a specific kind of anger. And the anger that he's talking about is that anger that we have that are, sits in the front of our heads that simmers little by little by little that eventually boils to this crazy crazy, explosive kind of anger that then turns into hurtful and hateful word and action. Now, Jesus mentions two words that express this kind of anger. Remember that weird word, raka, that we talked about. Not rock aware or, you know, any of that Jay-Z stuff. Raka, R-A-C-A. 
It means empty or worthless. And you usually in that time would use it as an insult. So it's like me saying, hey, yo, Nick, you're an idiot or you're stupid. Like that's raka. That's what that is. And usually, you know, nowadays we joke around and be like, hey, yo, dog, that's stupid, bro. That's dumb. Like we, we joke. But when we say like we're angry at someone like, bro, I can't believe how stupid this person is or how, how dumb or, 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 or worthless this person is. That's the kind of anger that Jesus is talking about here. And the word fool, whenever the Bible uses it, 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 it does mean foolish, but what it's speaking to is someone that is rebelling against God. Fool in the Bible was used to mean a rebel against God. You could think of using the word raka as an attack on someone's intelligence and using the word fool as an attack on someone's personal moral integrity. Now, what's good to know and what's important to remember here is this is not the words that Jesus is concerned about. Again, I said, we say, hey, yo, bro, that's stupid, dude. Like, what the heck? What he's concerned about is the attitude behind those words, right? The attitude that, that when we use those things comes from a place where we only see someone's worth only in that they are so bad that they deserve a place in hell, that they're going to be down to hell. That's their worth. Or someone that's so worthless that they can never do anything right. And that, that attitude comes out in those actions. That's the kind of anger that Jesus is talking about. You see that anger is responsible for so many of the horrendous, horrible things that happen in our world today. Y'all been watching the news or you've been on social media, you know about the shooting that happened in Buffalo about a week ago, right? Because of some, some hateful things that this person had. He was angry at people because they did not look like him. That is caused from anger, right? We have another dude on trial right now shooting up a school, for shooting up a school a couple years ago for the very same thing. He was angry. People will say that, you know, there's, there's a mental thing there, and yes, that could be true, but there's, there's a big anger issue that is born out of that, right? Racism in, their, in the country right now comes from a place of anger. Sexism comes from a place of anger. All of those things that we see on the news that are bad come from a place of anger, and what's crazy about this kind of anger is that your friends can see it, your family can see it, even strangers can see it. And when you see it, and when they see it, people don't come around, right? They kind of, they go away from you, right? It pushes and drives people away. In Proverbs 29, 22, it says that an angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man bounds in aggression. Now, what this verse was also talking about, the, the verse in, in Matthew 5, is saying that this anger can make you guilty enough to face judgment from God, and that can be a hard pill to swallow sometimes. He doesn't say that, that everybody's going to be everybody's going to be guilty of this, right? He, he uses the word subject to a lot, that you may be subject to judgment or in danger of judgment. That doesn't mean that you will face judgment from God, right? Not everybody that's angry will face judgment from God because of their anger, but is a possibility, uh, this pastor, John MacArthur, puts it really well. And when I was studying for this, I came across this, and it, it, it blew my mind the way he said it. So I wanted to bring it to you guys. He says it like this. He says that it is possible for a model law-abiding citizen to be as guilty as anyone on death row. It is possible for a person who has never been, even been in so much as a fistfight to have more of a murderous spirit than a multiple killer. Many people in the deepest feelings of their hearts have anger and hatred to such a degree that their true desire is for the hated person to be dead. The fact that fear, cowardice, or lack of opportunity does not permit them to take that person's life does not diminish their guilt before God. What he's trying to say is, is that I can have so much anger towards someone that I want to run them over. I want to make war zone real, and I want to have them in front of me, and I want to do things to them, okay? That is the kind of anger that he's talking about. And just because I don't have the opportunity to actually make it happen, guess what? In my heart, I already did. And that's where God is concerned. Remember that God cares about the heart, the condition of our heart. And remember that even the Bible says that out of our heart comes the things of our mouth. And that doesn't mean just things we say. It's speaking to action. The action that we have all comes from in here. So let me ask, do we take that seriously, like on the real, in real, real life? Do we take that kind of anger seriously? And it, it may not 
like feel like such a big thing sometimes. Like this person did me wrong or this person did me dirty. They hurt me. They cheated on me. They, they, they took something from me. Whatever the case may be, it may not feel wrong at the moment. And you're like, you know what? They did something so wrong to me. I feel like I should have that. I feel like I should be able to have those feelings, those emotions towards them. It's like I'm not, I'm not hurting them. And I'm not even like outwardly telling them that I'm mad. They probably don't even know that I'm mad at them. What does it matter? Right? Now, that, that may be good and well, but what Jesus is telling us in this passage is that even that low, that simmering, simmering anger, that rage that starts off like this always, eventually is going to come from small like this to over here, explosive like this. And it's funny because I wasn't even thinking about this until I was cooking dinner last night, and it made so much sense to me. Me and uh, Melissa were cooking something last night. And it came to the part where we're supposed to boil water. I was trying to make some rice, you know what I mean? And so, you know, you got to boil rice before, uh, boil water before you put the rice in. So, okay, I turned the stove on and I, I put it there and I'm waiting for it to boil. And it starts very, very slowly. Like it just starts like fizzing at the bottom. Like you look at the bottom, these little tiny little bubbles are at the bottom of the, the pan. And then slowly a little bit, you see, okay, the water starts going like, like this a little bit. It's not bubbling, but it's kind of like waving a little bit. And then what happened the other day was that on one side of the pan, or the, the whatever that is, the pot, whatever, I don't, I don't usually cook like that, so I don't know all the terms, but the thing you put the water in, right, it's bubbling on one side like crazy. Like literally on one side of it, it looks like it's going to shoot up water, right? And then literally from one second to the next, the whole thing just started bubbling like crazy. And so I was thinking of that. I'm like, man, that's what Jesus is talking about when it comes to our anger. We don't realize it sometimes, and it catches us off guard, but it can literally be one minute to the next that our anger goes from something that we can handle to something that we cannot. So the good news is this, right? Jesus says that not only can our anger condemn us, but our anger can be corrected. Our anger could be corrected. Now, how many of us, when we get angry, Try to avoid people that, or situations or whatever that make us angry. Show of hands. Right? You avoid things and people that make you angry. Like, I don't want to be around you. I don't want to see your face. I don't want to breathe the same air you breathe in. I don't want to even, like, I don't even want to know you exist, like, at all. I'll avoid you. The danger in that is that we can, we can ignore the danger or ignore the situation, but if we don't take steps to remedy what it is that makes us angry, it could still get out of control. Now, Jesus here in, in the passage you read offers us some medicine, right? He gives us medicine for this problem that we have. The problem with medicine is that it doesn't taste good. If you ever had Robitussin ever in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It works wonders. When you're sick, your mom gives you Robitussin or sometimes she gives you Vicks. Like, I pone a Vicks, like here, like whatever, you know? Don't eat the Vicks, though. That's, that's not a good idea either. But Robitussin is nasty. It's disgusting. I hate it. My mom used to give it to me and be like, yo, please, I don't want to take it. It's gross. But it's good for you when you're sick. And that's the same thing here. What he's telling us, it's not going to be something that is palatable to our mouth. It's not going to be good. We might not like it, but this is, this is what will help the situation. He tells us that uh, we have to be reconciled with the people and the situations that make us angry. And he paints a couple of good pictures in this passage of how that looks. If you look in 23 and 24, there's a story of the person worshiping at the temple. He's ready to put his offer, his sacrifice there at the altar. He's like, yo, God, here, I brought all this to you. Take it. Toma. I don't want it. It's all yours, God. Have it, right? But he's telling us that if we are angry, we have unresolved conflict with someone, we are to leave that there, go back to the person that we have that conflict with, fix it before we give our, our praise, our worship, our sacrifices to God. And why do you think that may be, right? Because, you know, it's good to offer stuff to God, right? We're supposed to, right? We're supposed to be uh, uh, living our, our, our lives for him, right? We offer our bodies, our lives as a living sacrifice to God, right? What happens is if we have anger, right, we know that, especially if you're, you're, you've been in life a little longer, you know what anger does to your mind. It clouds it. 
It blinds you, right? You see red is a very, uh, very uh, uh, common phrase. When you're super angry at somebody, you start seeing red, right? Because our mind is clouded, we can give all this stuff to God, and that's great, and that's well. But do you think we'll be in a position to receive anything from God if we can't even hear it? Because our minds are so clouded with anger? I didn't think so. That's why he's telling us to resolve our conflict first before we offer anything to God. Because we cannot do so without a clear mind and be ready to receive from God what he has for us. If, we, if I can't hear him, I'm so clouded by anger. The other one that he says is that there's a, there's a, a he moves from, from religious setting, so the, the separation from God, to then separation from someone next to you. He moves to like that legal setting where he says, before someone takes you to court, make sure that you settle up before they take you there. Because if you don't do it, guess what? That person is going to give you over to the judge, and then they'll give you over to the jail, and this and that and the other. What happens when you let unresolved conflict with someone go too long? It goes from something that you can manage and is in your hands to something that is no longer in your hands. They may be so mad at you now that nothing you do to resolve that conflict can ever resolve it. And guess what? It's because you waited too long. You waited longer than you should have to resolve the conflict. Now, why do you think we try to avoid resolving conflict with people? Let me hear a couple, a couple things here. Why do, we, why do we avoid resolving conflict? AJ, what do you think? Maintain peace, okay. Uh, Cynthia, why do you think we, we, we avoid conflict? People are hard-headed. Girl, you're right. Shoot. People are always hard-headed. Ebony, why do you think we avoid conflict? Because it makes no sense. You're right. Some of the reasons that we, we, we avoid conflict, it boils down to it doesn't make sense, right? It, it, maybe we don't want to be reconciled with that person because they're hard-headed, because it doesn't make sense to reconcile it, right? Maybe it, 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 we don't want to even make the first move, right? We're like, man, they're the ones that messed up. They should be apologizing to me. Why do I have to go and reconcile with them? They should be the one coming to me, begging me for forgiveness, right? Or even better yet, we, we, we put it off because we have this thing in our head sometimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but again, if you're a little older, you've done this plenty of times like I have. You are, if you are angry at someone, you are the good guy in your situation, right? You're like, you know what? They mess up. I'm the good guy. They're the bad guy. I don't want to own up to it or I don't want to resolve it because guess what? That makes me the bad guy in their, their eyes now, and I, should, I shouldn't have to stoop to that level to, to reconcile conflict, right? When you think about it, at the end of the day, all of those reasons really boil down to, to an issue of, of pride. And that's, hard, that's a hard pill to swallow. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily like a horrible or a bad thing, but that's just the reality of it. It is a pride issue. And then you may be asking me this question. If, what, if, what if the other person doesn't want to get reconciled? What about that? What if you're ready and willing to reconcile with this person and they want nothing to do with it, right? Reconciliation can't happen unless there's two people, right? But here the Bible gives us an out. Romans 12, 18 says this. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. What he's saying is, as much as you can do in your situation, Without even the other person, make the peace there. If the other person doesn't want to do it, that's on them. You did right by making peace with yourself with the situation. If it's in your anything that's in your, your side of the court, you do it. Don't worry about their side of the court. That's on them. And I think that if we were to do that maybe a little more, we, we could have less angry lives. And I'm not saying that there are some situations that are not maybe deserving of anger when people do us horribly wrong, when people cheat on us, when people steal from us. Maybe sometimes people steal things from us we can never get back. But it does not change what God is saying here. And it's like forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is not for the other person. It's for you. I'm not forgiving someone because they need it. I'm forgiving someone because I need it. I can't hold on to that anymore. Now, before we wrap up, uh, you know, we've been doing some panel stuff. We've been doing some questions. And um, I kind of wanted to get a couple opinions from, from some people on this, right? We're talking about anger. But the flip side of anger, uh, some could say, is joy, right? 
you have anger and then you have joy. Joy is not happiness, right? A lot of people will confuse joy with happiness. Joy is something that only God can give you. It only comes from God. Happiness you can get from whatever. I don't care. People say money can't buy happiness. Shoot. <laughs> I've bought some good things with money. <laughs> All right? But money cannot give you joy. Only God can give you that. So I wanted to ask a couple people, a couple of your leaders, a question. How does God's presence in your life uh, reflect joy those around you? So, Nick. What's up? What's up, baby? Stand, stand up, bro. Yeah. So. <laughs> what's up to you guys, too? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nick. Um, and so if you don't mind, can you. Re- yeah. How does God's question? presence in my life spread joy around me? Or how, so in you. Sure. Yeah. So I always say that God is the source, mm-hmm. right, just to begin with. Yeah. Um, and I call the Bible the source material. Yeah. Right. So for me, where I get my joy, just like you said, is from God. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, it's not finite, meaning that we get a bunch of it. And because of that, we get to spread it. Yeah. It's just kind of similar. Like, I always say that joy, kindness, they're like a currency. Yeah. Right. That you can spend it, basically. Um, and when I have a fi- I'm, I have an infinite amount of money. Why wouldn't I spend that freely? Mm. In a similar way, if I have an infinite amount of joy, why wouldn't I now, because of God's presence, spread that freely? Mm. Mm. Right? And so I'm not having to give out my joy. I'm giving out joy through me. Yeah. That's right? Good. And so for me, that's huge because I need my joy. Mm-hmm. You need your joy. Heck yeah. Everybody here needs their joy. Mm-hmm. So for me, if I can keep my joy, mm. and I know I'm going to be renewed and refreshed every single day, mm. Oh, I'm gonna spend that currency Heck that yeah. is joy. Yeah. And so for me, it becomes not even just easier, mm-hmm. but it becomes a blessing to bless. Yeah. And I think that's how we make a better world. Yeah. And, and just I think, in general. And I think that that counteracts anger too, right? Because it's hard to be angry when you're trying to spread joy around. Exactly. You know. Exactly. That's that's exactly it. Awesome. That's, that's it for me. Cool, man. Give it up for Nick. <laughs> Christian, what's up, dog? Yo. Yo. All right. Same question. Uh, okay. So. Uh, this is thing I've been saying recently. Um, no, you did, you did. Uh, human eyes only see as far as what the human brain wants them to see or comprehend, mm. Mm. S- which causes the misunderstanding and mm. the anger and the joy that we, not the joy, the hatred that we see mm. through this world. Mm. But eyes that see through the eyes of the Lord can see that one road mm. of peace and love and joy. And through mm. that, it's like saying, this is me, I am blessed. Mm. And through that blessing, we can just um, push that through to others. Man, preach, dog. That's good, man. That's real good. That's real good. All right, what's up, Reuni? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. good, okay. Same question. Um, so I've just been thinking that when I'm spending time with God and we're just allowing that, you know, that knowledge that this person this God holds, the whole world wanted me. Mm -hmm. Like he saw me with all my flaws and said, yep, I still want that one. And that like, that makes me feel, wow. So if that's how he sees me, how does he other people? And Mm -hmm. then my brain began to think, so what if we took a step back? Instead of seeing people like as what they're doing, seeing mm-hmm. them how God views mm-hmm. them, and then I became more considerate. Like you would see things mm-hmm. like, oh, maybe that person isn't yelling at me because they're actually upset with me. Maybe there's something bothering them and they're just taking it out on me. Mm-hmm. And then that gives you like seconds to reflect. Mm-hmm. Like how am I going to react and how am I going to behave so that they are witnessing God through me and not seeing Reuni at like her like flesh at full mm. maximum level. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah, that's just what I've been thinking that like God's joy makes me more considerate of those around me. Mm. And I'm not doing this like 1000% all the time. Like right. I'm just saying yeah. it's like I progress to like, wait, maybe they need something. Maybe mm. they just need someone to like look at them, see that they're not feeling well and mm. be like, are you okay? Do you, yeah. do you need a minute? Yeah, yeah, I hear that. That's good. That's good stuff. Give it up for, for our student leaders. Very wise. Some very good stuff. And like I was saying, like after Nick was talking, it's hard to, to have anger with someone. Like when you think of everything that these people said, do you think it, it, it's that that and, and anger can kind of live in the same, same like thing? It really can't. If I'm trying to spread joy to those around me, 
I can't, it, like it counteracts anger. If you're actively trying to spread joy, you can't spread anger at the same time, right? Because you're spreading what, what, what God is, has given to you. And it's like Ryuni said, you know, maybe you're angry at them because of how they're treating you. And maybe, and, and, I'm, and this doesn't work for all situations, granted, right? Because there are some sick people out there. But if there is something wrong with that person that maybe if you took a step back and said, you know, what, I'm going to put anger to the side for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and spread joy to this person and let me see what this person is going through. Maybe it's a misunderstanding that because we're in our, in our feelings sometimes that we get angry, that that's really the root problem of it. And we've just took it, taken this person's stuff and put it on ourselves, right? So that's good stuff, guys. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go wrap up here really quick. And this is the last point I want to make, right? We first have to realize that danger, the danger of our anger, we have to reconcile to those around us. Or Jesus warns us that anger will confine us. And that's the last point that I want to make is that anger will confine us. Or if you want to say it like this, anger will imprison us. We can be prisoners to our own anger. How many of you guys are familiar with the concept or the idea of a debtor's prison? Who here knows what a debtor's prison is? Okay, cool. We have a couple people. So back in Bible times, and this exists to some extent here still, even in the United States, even in other countries in the part of the world, is the idea of a debtor's prison, a prison for those that have a lot of debt, right? Usually what would happen is that if you have outstanding debt, the person that you owe will try to take you to court. They'll take you to court, and they'll tell the judge, hey, look, this person has a bunch of money, and they... Will, they either refuse to pay back or they cannot pay back. So they get thrown in jail for it until someone can come and pay them back. Now, there is usually, in that scenario, no one is going to get that person out. No one will get this person out of jail. That's what Jesus is referring to here in that last part of that verse that we read earlier. Jesus is saying that this is exactly what anger will do to us if we do not take steps to correct it. The longer we hold on to our anger, the longer we stay imprisoned by it, okay? The longer we hold on to it, the longer we build the bars of our own jail. Matthew 5.26 says that, Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Now, if someone is hopeless in a debtor's prison, and the only way is, it, like, really they have no way to get out, how does this hopeless person get out of prison? Someone has to pay a debt for them, right? Someone has to come and pay the price for them. Someone usually pretty rich, you know, someone's got a lot of money, come up and say, hey, look, uh, I want to take on that person's debt. I'm going to pay all the money that they owe and uh, just get them out. I'm just going to get them out of there, okay? Now, when we think about our anger and we think about our lives, the only person that can get us out of the prisons that we put ourselves in, especially the one with anger, is Jesus, when we turn our eyes and our minds to him and away from the things and the people and the situations that anger us, he can set us free from it. Now, that does not mean that from one minute to the next, your anger goes away. It's not like a, a pill that you pop and, oh, cool, I'm not angry anymore. Great, right? No, it's process. And it's a, a re repeating of having to go back to God and having to go back to Jesus and say, hey, look, I'm going to go to you instead of go to this that's making me angry. And it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but in, 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 if it were me, I would rather go to the person that has the key to my cell than to the things that are going to keep me there longer. Right? Like, you wouldn't, if someone has the key to get you out of jail, wouldn't you want to go to them instead of wanting to go deeper in? A lot of times people fight in jail, get there longer, all that stuff. I would rather go to the person that has the key to the cell that I'm in. Now we're going to wrap up, we're going to pray, and I want to pray for a couple groups of people. The first group I want to pray for is those of us that right now that are sitting in this room have some type of unresolved conflict. We don't need to know what, we don't need to know who, we don't even need to know why. You have unresolved conflict. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you, let's go ahead and, and pray to God together. God, um, we thank you. We thank you for um, paying a debt for us that we couldn't take on.
God that um, we know that there are things in this world that will anger us, God, that, um, that there are people that make us angry and we've been wronged and, and you know, it seems like it's, it's just not something that, that I can get over, that we can get over, God. Uh, we know that with you, though, that you take on anything that we give you, God, that there's nothing too, too small, there's nothing too big, God, that we cannot give to you, God. So uh, we give right now the situations that we're in, God, uh, to you. We don't know how long the situation will play out. We don't know how long uh, it will take for this to be reconciled. But uh, we know that, God, by putting it in your hands, that the situation that is in our best interest, God, that is favorable to us, uh, will happen because it's coming from you and not from our own doing, God. So right now, I just give uh, our anger to you. I give the situations and the people and the, and the places and the things that have uh, done us wrong, God. We give them over to you, God, knowing that at the end of the day, you're going to do with it what we can. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. Now, the second group of people I want to pray for is that maybe anger is not the prison that holds you. Maybe there's a different kind of prison that is holding you, that is keeping you locked up. Maybe it's what you came in here with. Maybe you have feelings of worthlessness. Maybe you have feelings of uh, despair, of anger. Maybe uh, people have been telling you, you know what, the life you lead is not going to get you anywhere. Uh, that maybe the thing that you did last night, last week, a month ago, uh, is too bad for anyone to love you, for even God to love you. Uh, I'm here to tell you today that none of that is true, that nothing is too bad, too wicked, that you may have done for God to love you because of it, right? That the jail that you're in because of it, God has the key to get you out of. And it doesn't matter how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter how bad of a person you are. I'm going to tell you just flat out, if you would have asked me 10 years ago if I would have been here on a stage giving the word to anybody, I would have told you, yeah, right, you're on crack. Like, no. Because of where I was at in my life. I was drinking. I was cursing. And I'll be up front. That's still an issue that I still struggle with, bro. You get me on COD, bro. I'm going to have to pray to God for forgiveness after sometimes because there's just things that come out of my mouth that I cannot repeat. I'm a work in progress just like everybody else. Up here doesn't mean that any of us are perfect. Just because AJ's up here doesn't mean he's perfect. Just because Ashley or Ebony or anybody's up here does not mean that we're perfect. We all have stuff in our lives that we're working on. But God has rescued and delivered us all the same. Okay? And just, and here's the other thing, just because you give your life to God doesn't mean that your sin goes away. Sin is a thing that as humans we will deal with, but the difference is that the sin will not hold us down, it will not imprison us, because guess what, God has taken it from us. So if that's you, and our heads are still bowed, and our eyes are still closed, and you decide, you know what, I don't know who Jesus is, you're talking about Jesus is the person that can set me free from my anger, um, but I don't know who he is. Let's just pray this together. God, I love you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for uh, dying on a cross for me, for paying a debt that I couldn't pay. That uh, it's only because of you, God, through, through conquering first death and then conquering the grave, that I'm able to live my life uh, uh, unbound from the sin that, that, that comes in daily, God. I love you. I thank you. I'm sorry for doing my life my own way. And from this point on, I'm going to do it yours, God. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. Now, heads.